Are you ready to hustle? I need to hustle, hustle. Welcome to The Hustle with Justin Harrison, the ultimate podcast for money, motivation, and inspiration. In this season of The Hustle podcast, we are talking to solopreneurs, entrepreneurs who have their very own unique journeys and questions around money and finance. And it is challenging being on your own. And today I'm here in Pretoria with Michelle. And Michelle, you've got some questions for me. Yes. Let's go. So I wanted to know, um, you've got very different thoughts about how to go about capital. Yep. So for instance, we've been taught, you know, like my cars, all my cars have been bought cash mm-hmm. because you've been taught that cash is king. Yep. But I understand that there's a better way of doing it. Like mm-hmm. if the, my next vehicle that I need to purchase mm-hmm. to rather invest the capital and mm-hmm. then still get financing but paid off with the capital. Can you explain what's the better way of actually so purchasing a vehicle? I think as an entrepreneur who's just starting out, you should have your vehicle paid for in cash because there's no guarantee what next month's in- income is going to be like. Once you build up enough diversity in your income and once you have enough streams of income coming in that you're pretty confident that you always have money no matter what. This is a time when you start saying, okay, how do I leverage my money more intelligently? And so if you can invest your money for a 10% return and pay, let's say, 7% on vehicle finance, it makes sense not to use your money. Invest the money at 10%, pay the financing at 7%. But that doesn't work if you are financing at 10% and only earning 7% on your money. Mm-hmm. Right? Because you still have to add earned income earned to income. pay off the income. And I go a step further. Never take on finance on a primary source of income. So what I would do when, and this is how we structure things, is I say, let's say I want to buy a vehicle for a million rand. I'll take that million rand and I'll invest that million rand and get, let's say, 10% return. Mm -hmm. And I'll use the return off that to pay the monthly installment on the vehicle. So irrespective of whether I earn income or not, that investment is still paying for the vehicle. So the principle is don't make debt on a primary source of income. Does that make sense? Yes. And so do you have any advice for like at what stage should you be looking at getting a new vehicle or should you drive it until the wheels fall off? As an entrepreneur, If you are not reliant on that vehicle to earn your income and reliability is not the most important factor, in other words, it's purely to get you to work and back, it's Mm -hmm. not to go and see clients. In that case, drive a car for as long as possible, accumulate capital, because you're in the business. A business is about accumulating capital. You've got to get money, right? So don't waste it on something stupid like a car. Okay. But if the car is part of delivering the product and service, Mm -hmm. make sure you've got a reliable car. Mm-hmm. the most reliable car. And then if I understand correctly, instead of then putting it in savings and getting 10%, invest it at a higher rate and then invest. pay off the car in full with the investment uh, return. Correct. Very interesting way of looking at it. Thank you very much. Pleasure. How can I become a citizen of another country or have residency of, of just, you know, because the problem is we just have South African passport mm-hmm. and we know that the environment these days mm-hmm. warrants you to have some sort of backdoor to another country, but mm-hmm. I don't have ancestry, you don't okay. have um, special business work permits that you can get in another country. So how can you, at my level, think of actually... Dating.com. <laughs> so you can marry someone. Yes. And get citizenship. You can make an investment in some countries, but it's excessively expensive. The cheapest citizenship by investment program is about 150 US dollars, 150,000 US dollars. Okay, the average working class South African doesn't have that, mm. right? But there are slightly longer ways to get citizenship elsewhere. Like you can go to Peru, you can take up residency and go visit three times a year for two days at a time, and do that for a period of five years and you would qualify. Okay. There's a lot of programs like that out there. There are options. The quickest way is to marry someone. The quickest way if you don't marry is to invest. Okay. And then the third way is to naturalize yourself by taking up residency in another country. Living there, you know, they're spending time. Yeah, in some there. countries require you to actually live there, but others, they, they say to you, as long as you take up residency, whether you actually are resident or not, mm. they don't actually care. So there are some countries like that, but not many. Peru is one of them. Okay, yes. I've been to Peru. It's interesting. Okay. So also, because everybody was thinking first world, EU, UK. I cannot understand why anybody would want to have a UK passport or to have a US passport in the times that we live in. The argument would be for visa-free travel. My argument would be, where do you want to travel? Mm. I can tell you that some places where I travel, like, for example, Southeast Asia, 
the South African passport is more friendly than the UK passport or the US passport because they've been colonized by the UK. Okay. Historically. Mm -hmm. And they're very, they're very anti-UK passports. So it really depends where you want to travel. Me personally, I don't want to go near Europe. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go near the US. I love Southeast Asia. I love Africa. And so those passports are not great for me. Okay. Plus, if you have an American passport, you can't hold any other passport. Oh, okay. South African passport <clears throat> does allow you dual citizenship. Okay. And your thoughts on like New Zealand, Australia? Again, a very personalized view on it, but I have spent time in both countries and it's not for me. Okay. So maybe travel, spend some time. Absolutely. In I'm, I'm 77 countries. In. <clears throat> wow. And out of 77 countries, I think I found four that I really love. Oh, wow. And the ones that I thought I would love are actually the ones I ended up hating. Because I go and, I actually, unlike most tourists, I'll go and live there for six months and figure out how society is actually structured. South Africa is still an incredible place. It, re it really, really is incredible. We, we got our problems, but it's still one of the best places on earth for now. Okay. But you don't need to be a resident in countries to maybe own a business or run a business through certain countries. No, it depends on the country. Okay. It depends on the country. I mean, there are countries where you can register business as a non-resident. As long as you're not conducting business in that country and it's worldwide business, you can have a business registered there. Okay. But, and the business won't give you a foot in the door to... Some countries, yes, but it goes back to the investment scheme. Okay. You're going to have to put a certain amount of money on the table. Mauritius is an example. If you set up a, a company in Mauritius, you can get residency and citizenship, but you've got to put out half a million US dollars. Okay. Into, into the, the business. <clears throat> they want to see you as a contributor to the economy. Okay. That's why they're granting you citizenship. So in your business, so if you grow a massive conglomerate, for yep. instance, that warrants employing a lot of people in that country, Absolutely. that can also be... Well, it doesn't even have to be employing people. It could just be the capital benefit. Okay. Right. Wow. So, so, so not even has, in the economy, in exactly, your business. Exactly. Oh, wow. So like Mauritius, for example, if you're doing 20 million US dollars a year worldwide income but you're bringing that money into Mauritius even if you don't employ a single person that's a net inflow of capital into the Mauritius economy because you're banking there okay that's an incentive for them to give you citizenship okay interesting but my, money and marriage two quickest ways <laughs> I choose the business way <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I am a single person. I mm -hmm. don't have any independence. Um, yeah. So when it comes to property, would you advise me to buy property or rent? Rent. No children, no husband, and you're busy building your own empire. Why would you commit yourself to a specific location? There's no guarantee where you're going to be a year from now. There's no guarantee where you're going to be two years from now. A property at a minimum is a 10-year commitment. So the question is, are you prepared to commit to something right now for 10 years? And the obvious answer has got to be no mm. for where you are at in your life. So it just shows you because the conditioning is yep. you are you know, a low-class citizen. You don't yep. really know what you're doing if you're renting rather yep. than buying. So that's an Well, uh, let's break that stereotype. Most billionaires don't own their property. Hmm. They rent. Now, there's a misconception when I say this. People go, oh, well, you're talking nonsense because billionaires own a lot of real estate. Yes, they own a lot of real estate, which they rent out to other people. But their primary residences, they don't own. Why? Mm. Because they're very flexible. They're moving all the time. Mm. They're constantly on the go. And so it doesn't make sense to be paying for a house there and paying for a house there and paying for a house there. So my advice is when you are still building your empire, rent. Remain flexible. If you're a youngster who is just starting out in your career, rent, don't buy. Because an opportunity can come your way in two years' time that will take you to another country. And now you're two years in on something that you actually should be committed to for 10 mm. years, minimum. Makes sense. And you're going to lose money. If you have the option of buying, it's probably going to cost you 10 grand on a bond, let's take an example, plus maintenance, plus upkeep, plus everything, where you could probably get the same property rented for six grand a month with none of the other headache. And in the long term, the difference in money, you could be investing somewhere else and actually building your wealth whilst oh, remaining flexible. Yeah. Oh, that makes because you, you think that a property is like an investment, but it's not. No, it's not. A property as an investment brings you income. You have a tenant in there paying you. That's not a primary residence. Most primary residences is a net outflow of cash. An accountant will tell you it's an asset. An investor will tell you it's a liability. So see the rent 
as an expense and invest yes. the capital you would have put in into Correct. the house at a higher return rate. 100%. Right. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, that's, I think, uh, very little people yeah. actually realize that because and, of the stereotype. And unless you are saying, okay, I'm prepared to stay here for the next 10 years, then, then by all means, maybe do the calculation and then maybe it makes sense to buy. But you need to do the calculation. Mm-hmm. And in the environment, the economic environment. Exactly. In, okay. You may not be in this country five years from now. Mm. Or what's now an upmarket area. Could be a terrible area. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of factors to consider. Mm-hmm. I'm personally much bigger on renting a primary residence than owning. And a lot of people disagree with me on it. But I go on personal experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because there's years and years of yeah. people doing the same thing. So. Yeah. Cool. If I look at investment, and yep. I think one of the best industries to invest in is the food industry, because you can never go wrong. Even if there's a, a pandemic like we experience, or there's a crisis, or a world war, people need food. So how best can you in, invest, if we, when I do eventually get to that level, mm-hmm. in food without actually becoming the farmer? So, I mean, I think that conversation is relevant to, to many other things. I think the medical profession is equally as important. People are always going to get sick. People are always going to get injured. People are always going to need hospitals. So you, you can extrapolate that beyond food, right? So the question is, how can I be involved in that industry without being a doctor? Mm-hmm. How can I grow the food and supply the food without being the farmer? Correct. Right? So I have a fundamental thesis of investing, which is to invest in the things that empower those industries, right? So I love buying stocks of companies that support industries. I'll give you a great example. I think the blockchain and cryptocurrency is gonna be around for a very long time, but I have no idea which cryptocurrency is gonna win out because they come and go every single month, day, year. Mm. So I look at that and I go, what is, irrespective of the, the cryptocurrency or the blockchain, what fundamental building blocks, technology, hardware is required to power that industry? So I own a lot of semiconductor stocks because Everything that drives that industry comes back to semiconductors, comes back to the microchips. Hmm. So invest in the industry that supports the industry. Like seeds, for instance, like Correct. machinery, like, oh, Correct. rather than the actual produce, production. And it goes back to my oldest theory of, of starting and running successful businesses. Supply the shovels, don't dig for the gold. Hmm. Wise words. That's amazing. Your way of looking at things are very different, but makes a lot of sense. Mm. That's amazing. You were mentioning something. You know, there's this tiny house movement thing mm-hmm. that's now exploded, mm-hmm. and you touched a little bit in the money tribe about like creating a, a tribe or a, mm. a, an environment where like-minded people can live together. Mm. How would that practically be possible in a country like South Africa where well, they'll probably steal and kill and destroy those little houses? I think it works in a gated community environment. Okay. I think where you have a body corporate and a set of rules where everybody contributes equally to the upkeep of the property, where everybody shares equally in terms of certain responsibilities, whether it be financial, whether it be upkeeping the community standards, I think that's the way it works. I don't think that works with everybody having their own piece of land. I think that is truly communal. And this is something I'm personally very passionate about. I think... The future of living and I think the future of estates and developments is a central communal garden, central water supply Mm -hmm. for that patch of land, central electricity supply with everybody contributing to that. Whether it be everybody puts in a bit of money and they've got people farming it for them and Mm -hmm. looking after it or whether it's actually people giving of their time and everybody lives off that garden. And it comes it comes back to the to the oldest notion of how we've lived as human beings we are actually meant to be in tribes Mm -hmm. we thrive as a tribe Mm -hmm. and we've actually been pulled apart exactly so i think that's where we're going in the future okay yeah because i i i'm all for minimalism i think minimalistic living i don't think we need the huge houses and the big cars and all the food and all that No, and i've made the mistake i've lived in the stupid house i've Mm. i've had the stupid cars Mm -hmm. and and I went from being completely materialistic to minimalist. Mm-hmm. And my life is infinitely better and I'm happier because of it. Mm-hmm. That's interesting because that's the lifestyle you want. But if you're not living on your own in a little piece of ground, you're like a sitting duck. For, for sure. And sense. so you need your tribe, right? Mm. And so I think that's why tribe and community is important. We touched on something earlier talking about some of your fears growing older. Mm-hmm. That fear exists because of a lack of community. Mm-hmm. 100%. 
If you have community, it changes everything. And that's why I talk about money as being a, a 360 degree problem, right? Mm -hmm. If you get the money and you don't have the time, then you're unhappy. Correct. If you get the time and you don't have the money, mm -hmm. you're also miserable and you have a headache. If you have the time and you have the money, but you don't have the community, you're lonely. Yes. That's why wealthy people with a lot of money do dumb things, mm. right? But if you've got community, you've got time, and you've got money, this is the holistic approach to being a happy individual. Yeah, I think you've, you've hit the nail on the head. Because I also traveled for, been to 22 countries, not quite like your yeah. 70 plus. For most of my life, 25 years, I was living out of a suitcase. But I think you get to a point where you've, you've got the money, you've, you've seen the world, mm. but, you know, there's no... You're lonely. You're lonely. Yes. I've been there. I've been there. I, I had a year where I took 55 international flights and I'd wake up in a hotel room and I wouldn't know where the bathroom was. I was that disorientated. And I, I said at the end of that year, all I want to do is hang out my hat mm. and I want to be with my friends. Mm -hmm. That's what I wanted. And I think we all crave that fundamentally. So we have to create it. So money should actually be the goal is to get into a community. For sure. No and, question. And that's financial freedom, isn't yes. it? Yes. Part of it. I mean, there's no point having the money and you're lonely. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. So but, you, all your effort, you're just like money, 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 money. Now you've got the money and there's no community. Yep. Or, or you've got the money and you've got the time and you've got no community. Yes. It, those three have to go together. Yes. You know, it's like if you've got a billion dollars and you're sitting on an island with no food, that money's worth nothing to you. You can't eat mm -hmm. the money. Mm -hmm. See, that's why I appreciate Money Trail, because you have a holistic <laughs> view. <laughs> exactly. Thank you very much for taking the time um, at your level to just come down to the underdogs and the soul props and taking the effort, because you don't have to, to come all the way and, and just help. You're an amazing person. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. I appreciate it. If you found value from this season of the Hustle Podcast, please be sure to hit that subscribe button or follow button depending on your podcasting platform. And if you really are finding value and enjoying this content, do me a huge favor. Leave me a review on your favorite podcasting app. It really helps us get this content out there and it helps new people discover this amazing podcast. And remember, hustle makes muscle. Stay motivated by The Hustle. Talkers talk, but hustlers hustle. Find more episodes at ecr.co.za or your favorite podcast app.